Voice of San Diego podcasts are sponsored in part by the San Diego Tourism Authority. As a nonprofit news organization, we depend on our members, foundations, and sponsors like the San Diego Tourism Authority to provide funding to support the investigative journalism you expect from us. We are very grateful for all of our supporters and we will recognize them during the show. From the one in eight local jobs provided by the tourism industry to the 289 million in hotel room tax revenue generated for the city's general fund, San Diegans have many reasons to be proud to live in a destination powered by tourism. As a nonprofit organization with a mission of promoting travel to San Diego, the San Diego Tourism Authority celebrates what tourism means to our community. Find out why at sandiego.org slash impact. And if you like the voice of San Diego's work and want to become a sponsor too, contact us at development at voiceofsandiego.org. Is this a trial? Uh, no, it's an interview. <laughs> ah, I see. I'm Scott Lewis. You are listening, of course, to the Voice San Diego podcast. This week, we wanted to do something a little bit special. We wanted to uh, set aside the interview. This week's interview, of course, with is with Bonnie DeManis, the former district attorney who's now running for county supervisor. And this completes our interviews of the county supervisor candidates. And this was the one we were hoping for for a long time. And it went <laughs> really well. It was really interesting. The interview is almost an hour long. And we talked, of course, about policies and the things she wants to do in the role. But we also had a lot of questions about her time as district attorney and uh, you know why she even wanted this job. And she reveals something about her health that really uh, surprised us, caught us off guard a little bit, and, and she says influenced her decision to run. Uh, we also pressed her on all these longstanding questions we've had about her knowledge or lack thereof of her campaign's interactions or just the interactions she had with a Mexican businessman, Jose Susumo Azano Matsura, who was later convicted of illegally funneling campaign contributions into a race here. Uh, foreign nationals are not allowed to donate to campaigns in the United States. So there's a lot packed in here. Let us know what you think. Uh, we are uh, really excited about how this turned out. But uh, without further ado, here you go. All right. We are joined in the Great Voice San Diego podcast studio by Bonnie Dumanis, former district attorney, former judge, former lots of things in the criminal justice system. Welcome. Thank you. So we have. Uh, I'll a let lot. you know whether it's good to be here or not after. <laughs> Fair enough. I imagine that we, uh, that, you know, it could get tense here and there, but uh, just to start out, we're very glad that you came. Thank you very much. I think uh, um, there's a lot of questions, but then a lot of chance for you to put some things in perspective, and I look forward to it. So the first question I have for you: is Your DA, you were DA. The district attorney is a pretty important position. Uh, we once called you the most powerful politician in San Diego. And uh, that were your words, not I my know. words. I yeah. know. That's what I said. We, yeah. yeah. We took a lot of heat for that. Uh, <laughs> but, um, uh, but you stepped down and you decided to run for county supervisor. Why? Well, you know, I've been the DA for, it was uh, when I stepped down almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of a life changing experience. Uh, I ran for re election in 2014 and won. Mm hmm. And then in 2016, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And when you get cancer, you kind of look at it with a different lens. I had an opportunity after the surgery and the radiation to spend that time reflecting on what I wanted to do and what um, things I could get done uh, before anything else happened. I'm cancer free though. Uh, I didn't talk much about it at the time because I didn't want our troops to worry, and they were already worried enough as it was. So, wow. Uh, so I um, decided that I wanted to do something other than um, what I was doing um, because I had seen so many victims come in who had lost a child, lost a family member, and looked into their eyes, and it, they would never be the same. And so I thought um, of the board of supervisors, but I didn't really decide until the end. 
um, that that's where the rubber meets the road in terms of preventing people from getting into crime and to prevent people who have mental illness from getting in there and substance abuse. So I wanted to be proactive for the rest of my life and do some, I did great things as a DA and I did a lot of alternate sentencing things. So I'm very proud of that, uh, like the drug court, veterans court, all of those. But I wanted to be able to be on the front lines where you go into the communities and can really make yourself accessible like I did as DA, but also do what's needed to do to keep people out of the system. Mm-hmm. Oh, when, were you, when was your diagnosis? My birthday, December 16th um, in 15. Had my surgery in January of, oh, I'm sorry. It was, yeah, it was 15 January 16th. Wow. I mean, uh, not January 16th, January of, of 16. I get it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And so um, you, we obviously, not a lot of people knew about that. I think I, I did know, but um, wasn't something that was openly discussed much. Um, and how did you manage the office during that period? What was it like? Well, I, I continue to work mm-hmm. and participate in all the important things, but it does... Um, have its, especially the radiation had its impact um, yeah. because not just when you had it, because I had to have it five times a day for five weeks, but then it's like cumulative. So I felt it for a long time thereafter. But, you know, I just think it, um, I have such a great team. I think that's one of the things I do well is to pick the right team. And uh, I had a good team there and I talked to them about it and uh, um, told them that, you know, I was going to be going through this. I only told a very few people at the beginning. Yeah. So um, you could you have run for another um, off uh, term at the district attorney? You, yeah, could, you yes. could have done one more. You, I could have done as many as I wanted to. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the term limits limited. Didn't, oh, okay. Term yeah. limits didn't apply. There's just supervisors. Got it. Yes. Um, and so you did have to make a proactive decision. Now, was that, a, was that a hard decision to step away from this office that you cared about so much? Yes, I remember talking on one TV station with tears in my eyes uh-huh. because I, I got the tears when I finally decided to not run again. And um, just thinking about that decision and talking to people about that decision, uh, I spent a long time there and as a judge, and that was my world then. And, uh, but in that world, I also dealt with health and human services as well as you know, public safety and uh, dealt with even the land use area. Um, to a certain extent. Um, so it was a hard decision. Um, when to leave um, became more clear to me because um, I was feeling the empathy was a little bit more uh, hitting me more. It's kind really? of like when you um, see dead bodies and you see people that um, have been traumatized over and over again and you talk to them and know you can't make them better, you can empathize. That's why I talked to the victims before death penalty decisions. Uh, and you know both sides of the aisle talk about in terms of the um, DA's office. Um, it became clearer to me that, that I had hit the point that I needed um, to do what I wanted to do um, you know, outside of the DA's office. And I, you know, it was a conscious thought also though that um, if I were going to run, and that was one of the things I was thinking about, that I didn't want to entangle the DA's office in a, another race, um, and I wanted to um, step back from the office so that the office could run without feeling um, that tension that exists when there's an election. Yeah, It's very frightening to the people inside because um, they don't know what they're going to get, uh, except in this case. But... Um, you know, everybody worries about that. Were you, um, had you learned something negative about what had happened when you ran for mayor uh, that that it caused too much political entanglements like you just described when you ran? Yes, I think that did have uh, an impact on me. Um, even during, you know, even though the people were attacking me, the office got drawn into that and that worried people in the office. So I had to continually reassure them, um, that sort of thing. But I I think that, um, you know, I've learned a lot from, uh, we changed processes a little bit. We, you know, that sort of thing. But I don't think that, um, 
I was grateful for the uh, opportunity to run, and I think um, from the choice that they made, <laughs> yeah. I think I would have been a much better one. But uh, again, you know, the people speak, and I listen. Well, let's. Uh, we have a lot of questions about the policy uh, and questions going forward. Let's go back to that time period a little bit and 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 start to understand. Get some questions out that we've been wanting to ask for a long time. Um, turn to uh, Andy. So, okay. So, um, this is, uh, we, we never really got to speak to you about this after, uh, the early stages. Jose Susumo Azano Matsura has been sentenced to three years in federal prison for illegally donating more than $500,000 to different political campaigns in San Diego. A lot of that money went to supporting you when you were running for mayor in 2012. Um, you were not charged with any wrongdoing. Um, and at the time, you had acknowledged meeting Azano during a luncheon at his Coronado estate. Can you just tell us a little bit now what you think Azano wanted to achieve um, and what you talked about with him at that time? You know, I just want to go back. Mm -hmm. I didn't acknowledge that mm -hmm. I met with him. It was part of the political process. Mm -hmm. And when the uh, indictment came out, I figured out it was me as one of the candidates, but um, what was your question? I lost it. Already. So, what, what do you think he wanted when you, you talked oh. to him? What do you think he wanted? What and what, well, what did you talk about? We didn't talk very much. Mm -hmm. um, I've and I'm not. You know, I'm not going to relitigate that case. What I am going to tell you is that everyone involved was prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Everyone, well, not everyone. At least three of the people that ended up going to prison had a jury trial. I testified in that jury trial. Mm -hmm. And they have now been held accountable and are in prison. And the other folks, uh, one pled guilty to a misdemeanor, uh, has been sentenced, and that's over. And uh, the last one, who didn't have anything to do with my any of the issues, um, has also been uh, sentenced to, uh, I don't remember what it was, but he, he's, his case has been dealt with by uh, a plea of some kind. Okay. And so I wanted to play you two clips. These were from an interview you did with um, Roger Hedgecock on UTTV back when the news for the scandal first came out, the ind indictment um, first taught the rest of us who uh, Jose Sumo, Suzumo Ozano was. Um, so before we play this clip, uh, what happened just before this, Hedgecock explains that Ozano put $100,000 into an independent expenditure committee that was supporting you, but because it was an independent expenditure committee was, committee was separate from your campaign. Um, and we also knew from the indictment that Azano gave another $100,000 to a guy named Ravneet Singh um, to spend on your behalf off the books, undisclosed anywhere. Um, so here, let's start with those clips. In the 2012 race, did you know anything about that? No. And Roger, first I want to say, I am so angry about all of this. I'm angry and outraged that if somebody did what they're alleging to do, they should be held accountable and for everything that they've done. Uh, I was taken just like everybody else. We're talking about lots of candidates here that um, received money in what took the FBI two years to figure out some sort of shell game or something. What is clear to me is that there is nothing that suggests that I've done anything wrong whatsoever. And in fact, I've been open and honest with everyone. You got a couple of reporters out there waiting for me. Ricky's talking to me. I said, I'll be happy to talk to him. I have nothing to hide. So after that interview, we learned um, that you had also met with Azano along with Sheriff Gore in March of 2012, and that you had also written a college recommendation letter for Azano's son. Um, can you help us understand, how do you explain your claim that you didn't know anything about him when you still helped him out with this by helping set up this meeting and with this college recommendation letter for his son? Is this a trial? Uh, no, it's an interview. <laughs> ah, I see. Yeah. Um, well, what I always said that mm -hmm. I had met with him once or twice, I remembered at the condo. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you all forget that it was two years later. And I was surprised, as you all were. In fact, I learned about it by a tweet. And Nuna, I was speaking at an engagement. My phone started blowing up. Liam Dillon was one of those, right? And I actually talked to him. Mm -hmm. um, I, from the beginning, when people were calling, talked to them. But, you know, I hadn't seen any papers. I hadn't been, you know, involved in it at all. Hadn't been interviewed at all. And so it was coming out 
to me like it was coming out to you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after having done that race and it was in the middle of the DA's race, um, I had seen thousands and thousands of people in in that. And the, the meeting with the sheriff was insignificant to me. So, and shows nothing. So, you know, I do not know him, did not have any conversations really other than, you know, the conversation at the condo and um, uh, with the sheriff. And both of those were benign. Uh, and I assume that's uh, why they didn't charge me with anything. Right. And and so, the, you know, it, through the end, end of the process, they never did. There was never any allegation that you had done anything wrong. Um, there was this kind of steady additional pieces of information. There was uh, subsequent to all this, there was another legal filing in which um, the federal prosecutors described an email you sent in December 2011 um, that uh, described uh, a conference call you had had with Azano and Ravneet Singh and Ernie Encinas um, in which you had discussed um, that Azano wanted you to meet with Singh because he was a master of internet campaign stuff. You also wrote in the email that you told Singh about the campaign's budget is- issues and you told your campaign that Singh flew to San Diego just to meet with Azano and that Azano uh, told Singh to talk to you. Um, you know what? Why didn't no, well, just, why gonna, did you no, never tell I'm any of the public go about there any of this? Because you have created an inference about me. Mm-hmm. I was not able to communicate with a independent expenditure committee. It was on my behalf, but I didn't know about it until it appeared in City Beat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, as things unfolded, I talked about it. I was forthright, honest, and I have nothing to do with that case other than I was a witness in the case. There's been a trial. There's been people that have been held responsible for that those actions. And I'm not the one on trial here. I'm the one that was targeted as somebody that was um, trying to gain influence or whatever and went to great lengths to hide that. And here you are making it look like I was going to great lengths to hide something. I never hid anything. I'm not going to go over every single line and explain it to you. I don't have to explain. Those that did it were held responsible. You know all the facts. And even if you put them all together, which you obviously have, very fair questions here. Um, I do. I do think these are very fair questions, and it's not because there's any sort of inference that over, you did anything Andy. illegal. It's 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 about whether there was uh, a sufficient forthcoming to the public about what happened that created this uh, this two years of revelations, rather than just saying, "Look, they, I, l- I looked through my campaign records. I looked through my emails. Here's everything I ever had about this guy." I didn't do that. I didn't. You know, know. you pack up your well. It was coming at me one at a time. So you all put people on it, right, mm-hmm. to go look deep for all these things. Mm-hmm. And that's what you came up with, very slight stuff. Everybody was trying to paint me as if I had this extensive experience. And by the way, even if I had extensive experience, mm-hmm. um, it's not illegal to know that there is a committee. In fact, now there are a bunch of committees that are open, and everyone who's in politics hopes that somebody – Opens up, and they and, and I guarantee you, those on both sides uh, in my race now have met with and talked to the people that are running. So that's not what the issue is, um, and I don't think I don't think it's fair that you are trying to raise an issue that no longer exists that people have paid the price for. It's gone through the ethics commission. I don't know if it went through the FPPC, but also Steve Cooley referred it to the attorney general's office, and therefore. Those that committed crimes were held accountable, and it should be the end of the story. So I think, if I if I may, I don't think there's any part of this we're saying you committed any ethical or legal violation. That's not. I think what there was a mystery about why this man came to town, why he invested as much money as he did, and we we've all since then been trying to piece that together. And I feel like um, we're still trying to understand exactly what he may have told you or what, you know, what was going on. I've told you everything. Okay. Okay. Well, so that's, but there was a couple of things that hadn't, we hadn't had a chance to ask about until now. And that's why. Well, those were all questions you could have asked before. We've we've tried. We've tried. We've tried. There was a lot of, a lot of uh, declined interview requests over the years. Well, I understand that. You know, I was in the middle of election at the time. This was raised in the election. There was plenty of people using it against me. 
And here I am. Do you think if I had anything to hide, I'd be sitting here right now no, in the middle of an election? That's great. That's why, you know? that's why we were so excited there's, to talk. There's multiple avenues beyond which that you have anything to hide. I don't think you do. Uh, I, I do wonder if you think that you were as open with the public as you could have been in answering some of these questions before they came up in legal filings two years later. Well, how would I know? I was hit by a two by four. Well, so the, I, I agree with that the day one, day two, day three. But, you know, it, over a two year period, you know, the, this was six months later, we found out about the sheriff's meeting. Uh, the UT months later found out about the the written letter of recommendation. It was two years later that the uh, campaign filing described this email. It, You know, the, I think, yeah, you were taken off guard, uh, taken by surprise like we all were with the initial filings. Understood. Stipulated. I don't think it's it would be fair to make you come out that night and release everything you knew. But between then and two years later, there might have been an opportunity to be a little bit more uh, more forthcoming about what your experience with this guy had been, especially given the level of mystery that surrounded the whole thing. I was forthcoming. And when those things came, you know, things jog your memory sometime. When the article came out about Sheriff Gore, that jogged my memory. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it was- Our article, you mean, about the meeting that you had with him and Azano? Yeah. Okay. I mean, none of this stuff, you know, I, I didn't comb through everything. I didn't, I didn't feel like I had to. I hadn't, you know, it came out that clearly by complaint, which was strange to me because I usually do an indictment, um, they clearly, you know, had been at this for a while. Uh, and I saw no reason to, like, look into it. But, you know, my campaign stuff was all gotten rid of for the mayor's election. My campaign committee was closed. Uh, and so, you know, I'm here to say if you had to guess who you interviewed— Two years ago, um, you wouldn't be able to remember. Now, if I showed you an email about it, you might be able to to remember. Yeah, that's the way it is. I, I, at every stage, when confronted with it, I was honest and open. And because I was honest and open, I'm the only one that got questioned. (laughs) Well, when you look back at that marriage race, um, you know, again, our words, we had called you the most powerful politician. Um, and you didn't do very well. Why do you think you didn't do very well in that race? Um, I Well, there were a number of things. First of all, there were four people, mm-hmm. and you had one on one side who got endorsed, and um, somebody threw their sucker in the dirt, and uh, then um, on you the You really other, like that line, huh? I really do. Yeah, <laughs> I really do. Um, Just to be for fair, our, yeah. you, for our listeners, why don't you describe what, who you're referring to? No, I don't need to mention <laughs> she, anything. She's talking about Nathan Fletcher when he decided to leave the Republican Party. You guys had this, um, among the four, you two had, I think, the most interesting rivalry at that time. I think you were both going for the same lane of voters in a way of the sort of center right for a while and and, uh, and just never made a deal. It seemed like there was a lot of pressure on you to make a deal, was there? No, there wasn't any pressure. <clears throat> I mean, I, if anybody asked me anything about it, I, you know, they, there were rumors that I was dropping out of the race, yeah. planted by the other sides Got or it. side. So, you know, I never was intending to, to uh, drop out of the race. I think it, a couple of things. One, um, as the DA, you know, you make um, a lot of enemies and, um, and people see me in the role of DA. And, and what they see is um, somebody that's strong, uh, you know, badass on bad guys and um, very much into progressive kinds of criminal justice reform. And so I don't think we did a good job sort of um, getting to my experiencing translating to, um, you know, that job um, as it is. And I think, you know, part of it is because it wasn't really in my lane with the city as opposed to in the county. It's totally my lane. Yeah. All of those people that you would deal with as a supervisor are involved. All the issues, homelessness, mental health, substance abuse, housing, all of that were issues that I dealt with. So I think, you know, that and um, not getting across the experience and how important that was. But I think there were just a lot of different things swirling around because, you know, Nathan got the same amount that he lost by before. So, you know, it was... I don't think they were trying to point out that I was taking from Nathan and that. Oh, you're talking about in the next race when he ran, he got the same amount, which means you didn't take anything from him. Yes. Got it. 
Well, let's talk about your time as DA. Um, you you were known, uh, as you said, as a pretty tough on crime. Um, there was some discussion after summer. Stefan took over the role. She said she was changing directions on your policy, for example, on marijuana. That uh, um, new regime in town, and 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 do you feel like she let the guard down on that? I don't know what you mean by that. I'm I'm proud of her for doing that. Oh, okay. The law changed in between. Okay. You know, and so my stance and my you you would have changed too. You said. yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. But you know, um, p- the, there's a narrative out there about me and marijuana. Okay, um, and that narrative uh, to me is false. Um, I've always been in favor of medical marijuana. I've always uh, wanted to uh, make sure we just prosecuted those who were running illegal dispensaries, and things changed a little bit during that period of time, too. Uh, and uh, in terms of recreational, I was not in support of it, but it is a law now. Mm-hmm. I don't have my DA hat on, and she recognized that it, you know, it is the law, and, but she moved faster than anyone, I think. Uh, as you, as If you got to be county supervisor, would you support more legal dispensaries? There's none allowed in the county's governed area. Would you support them? Well, what I've said is uh, that's something I'm willing and open to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I went out, uh, I'm sure you've heard that I went to Urban Leaf and uh, toured a dispensary. I didn't hear that though. Is that where you got the glasses? No, I got the glasses in Palm Springs. So, um, (laughs) and I was very impressed with it. I mean, you know, first of all, there are people standing in line outside. There are people and guards out front. And then there are people standing in line inside and they very have a um, plate glass window thing where they check people in, and it was very meticulous. Yeah. And when they let me in, you know, they showed me all the product and everything, and it was bagged and, uh, you know, has a little thing that you scan and all that kind of stuff. And then they showed me in back, uh, you know, where the vault was. Um, I'd like to have that vault, but um, and where the uh, <laughs> or what's in it? <laughs> what's in yeah. it? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, and showed me where the other inventory was. Uh, and then um, we, I talked with uh, Wilson, who's, who's the owner, and, and talked about a lot of issues that he pointed out to me that I think are concerning, um, you know, the, the, uh, the transportation aspects, the delivery aspects, all those kinds of things. He was telling me some of the problems that existed. And from a practical standpoint, uh, my biggest concerns are the kids and the driving on the roads. Um, and you know they've regulated that, but the science hasn't gotten to a point where you can tell like a BA yeah. with some kind of test at all. But that was the case before it was legalized, right? You still had to. It was still illegal to drive under the influence. Yes, but you, but now that it was going to be out there yeah. for anybody um, who wants to drive, um, so that you, if if it looks like you're driving under the influence, they can test for that, just like they test for a BA. What they do now is they if they look under the influence, they test them as if it was a, you know, um, DUI. And even if they've had um, something else, it's hard to prove in a courtroom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I was impressed with um, how business-like it was and um, how um, there are some issues. And uh, I think marijuana is here to stay, so I think we need to deal with it. One of the things that we've documented is that in part of the this true in certain cities as well, but certainly in the counties, uh, the unincorporated area, places like Spring Valley, some of these illegal dispensaries are uh, being shut down and then they, they reopen either almost immediately or certainly very quickly, that they're, they're being reopened faster than people can shut them down. From your in, in perspective as a prosecutor, law enfor- what you know about law enforcement, does that situation create more problems would it be better to have create a legal a system where they can open and operate legally given that there's going to be legal marijuana present in the county anyway and now the question is just how do you sell it well i think that's what we have to look at i want to hear from all the stakeholders though i mean i come from uh law enforcement but now i'm not in law enforcement so i'd like to hear about the people that are setting up and what they're doing and make sure that those things that they are doing um, protect the community and get the taxes that have been, you know, mm-hmm. um, given. I think, you know, with the president has sort of taken a step back from it, the issue, leaving it to the states. Uh, and so I think, you know, we have to grapple with it. But I'm a big person to have people come together 
talk about it, see see where we can agree and, you know, that sort of thing. I think it's always been a problem, though, with illegal me- medical marijuana, too, that they would shut down and then go, you know, someplace else and turn up and that sort of thing. I, I don't know if weed.com or whatever it is uh, could keep up with them either, but... Um, but we, they'll also probably be underground, you mm-hmm. know, uh, people sell them cheaper than those that get taxed, like, you know, the old cigarette tax, you know, kind right. of thing. Right. But I am definitely open to it. And, uh, you know, I've answered a lot of questions about it. I just uh, want to hear more information. And I've been talking to a lot of people today at lunch. I talked about it with a different group of people uh, that just really opened my mind to another whole thing, talking about social equity with the taxes. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't thought about it in that way before, and I, I find that really interesting, and I want to explore that more. Hmm. I wanted to ask about another uh, sort of flashpoint from your time as DA, and that was your decision to test the law in a new way in charging uh, several uh, people who were alleged gang members under this law, Section 182.5 of the Criminal Code. And it was essentially uh, characterized as like guilt by association uh, members of the gang could be held accountable for crimes committed by other members of the gang. And it's become a real flashpoint in the current race for DA. And when I speak with people um, in communities of color in Southeast San Diego, it continues to be really top of mind. Um, Do you have any reflections on on how that went? And would you do anything differently given that a judge uh, said it wasn't really the right way to use that? Well, I think I've made it quite clear uh, publicly that I wouldn't file it again. Um, when it was filed, it was with good intentions and with um, a legal theory, um, because 182.5 isn't a whole lot different than 182, which is the conspiracy theory anyway. Um, but the community had come to us with nine deaths, wanted it to stop, and we wanted to use all the tools in our toolbox. Um, that was irrespective of any race or anything else. But when I heard back from the African-American community and they started talking with me and I started doing some research, um, you know, I've, I've watched uh, the, the, mo- the uh, Netflix series 13th. I've uh, watched the uh, six-hour KPBS on from slavery, you know, to uh, the vote or whatever it's called. It was really good. Six hours and then another one, two hours and a lot of other things. And when I s- sit down, sat down with them and heard what they were saying is that in history and in time, the black community has been like a, a big, huge net cast over them to uh, find ways to prosecute or, um, yeah, to prosecute and put them in jail or prison um, for reasons that no one can really explain. But, you know, as time, you know, that's not something that was first and foremost in my mind um, because it was just any gang to me. Um, but when they spoke to me about that, uh, I really, you know, felt passionate that it was, um, it was something that could be used uh, in that way. And I said I didn't want to do it anymore. And... Um, and I haven't. And I've said, I'm sorry about that. Hmm. One of the things that surprised me recently, I, did, I moderated a debate with Summer Stefan and Genevieve Jones-Wright. They were running, uh, obviously, for your for the district, not your seat. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, you've been the DA ever since I was here. So um, when w- one of the things that uh, Summer Stefan acknowledged w- that she may consider was an idea that uh, Genevieve Jones-Wright has been floating, which is to create a task force that may be independent of some of the prosecutors in the office to investigate police-involved shootings. Um, Summer Stefan wasn't committed, but she said she was open and thinking about it. What do you think about that idea? I think it's a great idea. Some communities actually have task forces from you know the, the entire county that work on it. But um, I remember clearly when going into the community about, because I was very open about those, uh, about OIS, officer-involved shooting cases, sorry, Mm -hmm. using those words, um, that I'd be happy to turn it over to the AG's office, happy to be turning it over to the U.S. Attorney's office. Um, It always um, is something that the community is upset about, and I have no problem with, as long as law enforcement is involved, because there are things and experiences that law enforcement have that I think are necessary at the table. 
um, what happens in a civil trial is a lot different than what happens in a criminal trial. And um, if there were a task force of um, people that included, you know, the the uh, p- people like the uh, law enforcement community, I'm sorry, um, even from another jurisdiction or something, you know, to, to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think realistically, the law is that if a police officer has a reasonable doubt, um, then you have to look at it from that time frame yeah. that it's a split second decision. And I'm not so sure that whatever way you come down, I think people are still going to be upset about it. That's why we used to send letters to the family saying, if you want to talk about this, don't hesitate to call, but telling them that it's the decision-making process takes a long time. And then we reach out to them before we, we did things. So I think it, you know it's a tragedy for everybody. But one of the things I have also proposed in my mental health um, plan is to have peace officers trained in crisis intervention teams. It's kind of like PERT but it's a little uh, more intensified so that each officer, and that's long-term because it would take a while, each officer is trained on how to address mental issues or disability issues so that they, and, and uh, bias issues, if they, you know, the implicit bias, uh, that they are better able to handle this, you know, because their calls went up to, I think, the last two years, 19,000 for mental health cases. So this training will help them uh, in terms of understanding how to de-escalate and what to do. But it also deals with PTSD that officers have. And that is when you're engaged in this kind of profession, uh, sometimes you suffer from PTSD, and that makes you hypervigilant. And with that training, hopefully, and, and also having a mental health professional, if we can, we have, I think we're up to around 50 now in the county, but you know our county is huge. And as you know, they just can't always get there. That... Um, that this will avoid a lot. And the program that I suggested also was from Florida. And um, that program had officer-involved shooting cases, two a month, almost like us. And they went, after the training, they went down to one a year. Hmm. So, um, and it's also has a- What kind of training is that? It's called Crisis Intervention Team. It's a Tennessee model, but the, they used it in Florida. And Jackie Lacey is using, you know, some of that in L.A. as well. Um, I've looked at, you know, all of them. One of the things I propose is urgent mental health care, like an urgent care facility in the communities where the calls are um, many, you know, that, that they go to. And uh, that the police officer, once the police officer has the person in custody for an acute episode, they bring them this to the center, and they do it so that they can uh, have a mental health professional make the call on whether or not that should be a 72-hour hold or whatever. The officer drops them off, gives them the background, goes back into the field. Now it's in the hands of a mental health professional for up to 24 hours. They would either refer it to CMH, County Mental Health, for a 72-hour hold until they determine they're not a danger to themselves or others. And then if they are, they would transfer them there. If they're not, they would link them with services that they need. So they would basically have a case manager that got them to where they needed to be. Sometimes it would be to a responsible um, family member, Um, but sometimes it's to a rehabilitation center or um, a way of treating the individual. And sometimes they'll be calm by the time, you know, they get out of there and they can refer them. I wanted to go back for a second. You mentioned the legal standards regarding uh, officer-involved shootings. Uh, There's a bill currently in Sacramento uh, written by a local legislator, Shirley Weber, that would kind of lower the bar for when um, some of those shootings could be prosecuted. And we know they're very hard to prosecute. Um, Between 2005 and 2015, uh, there were 155 officer-involved shooting cases in San Diego, and none of which... uh, were prosecuted by your office. Were there ever times that you thought, you know, wrongdoing had occurred, but you felt like your hands were tied by the legal standards or? Well, each case is its case on its own. And, you know, certainly there are times when you wonder what the officer was thinking and, you know, how it, could it have been done better? But we're looking in hindsight uh, and I have to look at uh, the law. I don't think it's a good idea to change the standard. I think you're going to have cops leaving um, 
uh, because they're going to be fearful. Either they'll get killed or others may get killed in the process. I think it's a good idea to examine the process and sit down with all those involved because um, there could be things like this training that would be helpful. Uh, but I think if you check probably most jurisdictions, it's the same. It's, you know, uh, and officers are found not guilty most of the time. When I prosecuted the um, officer from Oceanside, they found him not guilty fairly quickly, and the officer had done several others and before, and they were all found not guilty too. That doesn't mean they're not held responsible, though, in the civil court. It's a lower threshold, and therefore um, sometimes you will see either a settlement or that they're held liable because they have a trial and they don't have to have a unanimous verdict. So, you know, the one thing that people don't see is that, you know, you have the police agency or the sheriff's agency that does a incident review. They have internal affairs that does an, a review as well. Then they have a citizen's advisory uh, group that does something as well. And then you have our office um, looking at it uh, as well. So, I think if you could see the process that we go over when we do one of these, because we, I don't make it in a vacuum. We all get all the, the um, most senior deputies together and the senior investigators together to talk about, put up a little show and tell about what happened. And I, in many cases, would read all the documents, go walk the scene, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that, you know, seeing it in action um, might give you more of a feeling of uh, respect than when you don't get to see it because, you know, we all see the instant replays now on TV uh, and it depends on which angle you're at. And if you only get one angle, whether it's pro or anti, you know, it's just one piece of the evidence. And that's why it's so concerning that we make sure that we are careful because um, people's lives are in jeopardy, people's reputations are in jeopardy. And we have a family that's, um, you know, hurting. I think the hard part has been this idea of, yes, it's not guilty uh, as far as a crime, but what, what can we do to make sure that we communicate that it's not the ideal outcome of an encounter of police and people? Like, what, what can we communicate? And when I asked this of a recent a person in the prosecutorial world, and they explained that we'll, we can't step out and say, that something went wrong here because all of law enforcement is a brotherhood of sorts. It's a partnership of sorts that can't be disrupted, that you have to be all in, that everything was okay or not. Um, but there's just no, there's no middle ground of just saying like, this was obviously maybe not a murder or, a, or even a crime manslaughter or something, but it was, it was not the way it should have happened. Would you ever feel comfortable saying that a police did not handle something, a police officer, the way it should have been handled? No, because as you've found many times, when we investigate a case, we don't talk about it afterwards. We don't talk. We, it's it's you either make a crime or not. It, yeah, you make the determination whether or not it's a crime. And if it's not, um, then you rely on the internal affairs investigation and the um, homicide uh, division of the law enforcement agency. We might point out some issues that might be in the future, something that might be considered. Uh, but, and it's not a question of, I, I know some people talk about, you know, that sort of thing. Our unit that deals with officer involved shooting cases is a different kind of um, group of people than the rest of the office in, in that they deal with the most sensitive cases and issues and do a very thorough job um, so that they can understand things. And that's why it would be good, you know, to kind of look at that process. But um, I felt no compunction about whether or not compunction. I'm not even sure I know what that means. That's it's good. Right. You yeah. used it right. Uh, did I use it right? Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, to charge an officer. Uh, I mean, as you remember, I did charge and, uh, you know, um, I wasn't endorsed after that. And mm -hmm. I get that. But, you know, when you're in that position, you're signing up for doing the right thing, whether it, upsets any group. Um, but, you know, having been a judge, i um, used to making the tough calls. Are we going to talk about this race? Yeah, now? yeah, going to do that. Um, I wanted to round out one more point about your DA time. Why did you choose Summer Stefan? You know, we've heard about this maybe conversation you had among your top deputies about who should uh, maybe run for the seat. And it's pretty clear that everybody, you were excited about Summer. Why? 
Well, it, and, and it, did you handle that the best way possible? Do you think? Well, I, our executive team looked at everyone, and Summer Stefan stepped up, and I I'm happy with that because Summer was in the chief deputy position for a while, but she rose up through the ranks in, you know, as a deputy DA, tried over 100 cases, and then um, went through as head of North County doing all that. Then she came and head of the sex crimes unit, and then she came downtown and learned about the budget. And every time somebody becomes a chief deputy, they go, wow, now I really understand what you do. And and so she had all of that experience as well as the rest. She was a forward-thinking person, uh, and not everybody is interested in the political life um, because they saw what happened to me. And they really, um, it was really Summer that stepped up. The other folks are equally as capable to do the job. It's just whether or not they can do an election, and that's what stops people from, from running. When um, the UT endorsed a rival for this uh, county supervisor race, the day we're recording this on Monday, and they said about you, they said, Dumanis was surprisingly underwhelming and showed little grasp of big topical issues like housing, marijuana, and little appreciation for why so many residents are frustrated with county leadership. What do you think about that statement? Well, uh, I've been schooling myself pretty well. I have an expert in housing, a uh, uh, person that, sat on the housing commission as you know cpa did a lot of work in the community uh, but i'm you know feel like we've dealt with these issues with law enforcement as i pointed out to them we ha i started uh as a team when i say i um the uh place with probation and and those coming out of prison our reentry system so that when they came out of prison they went to this place that would help them uh, detox if they needed it, physical stuff, you know, medical if they needed it, and sort of took them by the hand and found them a place to live. We, we don't do that a lot, and that's sort of the model that needs to take place with the homeless. You need to go to them and help them through the process. One of the things I see with these most vulnerable uh, populations is um, they're not able to, it's too overwhelming to go from place to place to place, kind of like the family justice system, you know, where, where you have a one-stop shop so that they can get the services that they need. And, and um, in the interim, they get to the place that they need. So I think having case managers um, that work with people on how to get your Social Security disability or how do you get your... Um, uh, Cal Works or you know Cal Fresh and all, all those self sufficiency programs uh, that they need. Uh, so I think I have a good grasp on it. What I didn't until I've really dug into it was affordable housing, uh, and um, housing that's affordable. And uh, I now have a pretty good sense of uh, how that works and um, what to do about it. And I'm going to unveil, not here, <laughs> a plan soon. Um, I'm, I have, haven't got it all together. I'm you know, like, ballots uh, are going out. we got to get this stuff. I know. Yeah, it's going to come out soon. Yeah. On that point, you, yeah, there's an ad out on Facebook. It says, this is you. It says, I'm committed to spending county reserves to tackle our homeless and mental health epidemic. Yes, I am. It's fascinating to me that that's become the de facto position of all of the candidates for this office. Um, why do you think the Board of Supervisors has not tapped into this uh, this money and why do you think um, you're, you'd be willing to more than they have? Well, I, I think um, the county did a good job when folks came in and there was like near bankruptcy. Yeah. And uh, they really turned it around and kept a lot of healthy reserves. Um, but I think if you look at the reserves now and you look at the problems that exist now, I think we have to prioritize uh, where our money is spent. And I think that there's that mental health pool of money too. So it's a substantial amount of money, and I think that the county has stepped up of, of late, you know, with uh, Ron Roberts and, and Diane Jacob, the $25 million trust fund and identifying properties. But uh, from my understanding now, it takes a lot more money to tie the knots with affordable housing because they need some match to get through the process. So I think that one of the ways the county can deal with this is to loan money and make it available so that the the match comes in and we all work together to get it done. There are like, I think 1,100 
um, possible affordable homes right now in the pipeline um, that don't necessarily have that matching. So you're talking about actually building units? Uh, well, through for, nonprofits. Through so. nonprofits, yes. So non Well, there's uh, for profit affordable oh, for-profit. housing and nonprofit affordable housing. Mm-hmm. And so for both of them, I think that, you know, they get their money from a federal stream, a state stream, some private money. And they have to juggle all that and get through the system at the same time. And so if they had some money uh, right now to do it, then they would get them going faster. The clear message is we have a housing crisis, we have a homeless crisis, and we've got to get to it and get to it now. And that's why I want to take from the reserves to address the issues. And I'm the only one that knows the county and how to navigate through the system, and I think I can get it done and get it done in quick order. The county is really received a, a, a lot of criticism, uh, including from us to a certain extent, uh, for its role in uh, the hepatitis A crisis and um, whether they had uh, sufficiently reacted and how quickly they reacted and the sort of bureaucratic response when things were starting to first come to light. Um, do you think that sort of thing is fair? And, and what it, what could the county have, have done better, if, if anything, to uh, move more quickly when it started to become clear that people's lives were at risk? Well, my position on that was we should have an uh, after-incident report that goes over all those things to see, you know, how it happened, if there were any people responsible for it, and how you could do it better in the future. We did that with the fires in 2003, and it made it much better for 2007. Um, But you have to have a rigorous program to look at it and look at what you did. Uh, And I think you know, ultimately the county will do that. Now we have the flu epidemic and uh, they're dealing with the flu epidemic. But As- Assemblyman Gloria has discussed maybe a, a state audit to look into this question. Do you think that's appropriate? Well, I think if anyone was going to audit, it should be uh, the uh, CDC, the um, yeah. agency that deals okay. with how you yeah. handle epidemics and that sort of thing. Uh, the state coming in not knowing all the details. And I don't know all the details, so I don't want to comment on whether there was or wasn't Uh, something. What I do know is that but for the hepatitis A um, crisis and deaths of 20 people um, in the process, I I think kicked the city and the county in the butt and finally took notice. And I've been reading reports uh, over the years that talk about housing first, which is the model I believe in as a good approach, uh, as well as some of these other issues and the, you know, the tents and all that kind of stuff. For right now, the tents are a temporary solution, but we need a long-term solution, which is the housing. And so I think you know, they've stepped that up, and they have wraparound services there. But we need, in the long term, we need uh, the housing. But we have to do it fast because we're not building to meet the need fast enough. I think last year they built 6700 for affordable housing, and you need about three times as much every year. So on on the market rate housing question, there are uh, about a dozen um, private developments that are going to be uh, approved by the county board of supervisors or come forward for a vote of the county board of supervisors in the next few months. Potentially could be before the November election. Some of them could drag on afterwards. Um, They collectively represent thousands and thousands of homes that would be uh, proposed. But they don't comply with the county's adopted general plan for future growth. Um, that general plan was the result of many millions of dollars in in planning. Um, they've it, it it did accommodate a certain amount of growth in very specifically targeted areas, and these are all plans that do not meet that stand meet those those regulations and do not meet that that plan. What's the appropriate way to make those decisions about whether whether to approve each of these individual projects that require a general plan amendment? Well, I think you need to hear from the people that live in the area, uh, as well as look at the overall impact to the community that community, as well as the bigger picture of the county, mm-hmm. and make your decision based on that. But the fact of the matter is, we have to have more houses built or rent, you, you know, apartments built if we are going to do anything for the homeless. So I think everybody's got to step up. It has to be a regional plan. And I think that everybody um, is going to have to look look for ways that they can help. If it's vacant government, MTS, there was just a report about 
uh, MTS circulate on how many properties they have. The county has some. I'm sure the city has some. Uh, so, you know, I understand that nobody likes change uh, and and people aren't always going to get what they want. But as long as you have a fair opportunity to share your opinions and what and the impact it has and you are informed about those decisions, then I think you got to make the call, uh, whatever it is, make the right call for not just those people, but the people in the county as a whole. The most sort of news making one of these efforts was the Lilac Hills Ranch proposal. It went to the ballot in 2016. Um, How did you vote on that? Did you support it? I don't think it was in my area. It was was the whole county. county. county, Oh, was it? No, I didn't get involved in that at all. Okay. And so would you support the new version of it? I'd have to hear all about it from the community, you know, all the stakeholders uh, in order to make a decision. Okay. A lot of these, a lot of these plans, what's um, to varying degrees, each of each plan is, is to some extent unique, but one of the things that they do generally have in common is that they're in semi-rural or rural areas right now, um, sort of not always in the back country, but away from the built out development, developed area of the county. Um, a lot of them not necessarily accessible by public transportation, that sort of thing. Um, now that's to some extent just a result of being in the county's unincorporated area. Um, but how much should that matter? How much should the uh, lack of smart growth or the lack of transit orientation of these developments matter in terms of whether they are granted a general plan amendment? Well, I think you have to have a balance. I think in the urban areas, density is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's close, the urban center is close to all the um, you know transit. But in some of the unincorporated areas, uh, there isn't much. So you have to make a decision about whether or not it's going to be accessible, you know, um, or, um, you know, what the problems are that exist in the area. Because there could be very good reasons that people don't want them in the, in the areas that they propose. But until you hear those reasons, uh, aside from I don't want it in my backyard, um, you know, I think that we have to look at the overall plan and we're going to have to have some growth everywhere, but it has to be growth that makes sense for the community and um, makes sense for the county as well. You know, there are fire issues in some of these, you know, back uh, country areas, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that I think you have to look at, but I don't think that at this time, anyone should kick it down the can and kick the can down the road anymore. I think it's time for action Bold action, that's what I've been known for with all my programs uh, and having to go through the county and fight those battles. And I I think it's a good time for me to be on the board because, you know, um, I'm doing this for nothing because I'm so passionate about it. There is uh, there are two potential ballot measures that might come up in November. One is uh, one would bar those kinds of developments without a vote. Would you support that? Say that again. I I, it would, I know there are two. So it's it would it would bar uh, it would it would require that uh, the anything that was approved by the board of supervisors go to a public vote, and that they would be they would need to me, uh, be approved by majority of county voters. It hasn't qualified yet, but it's collecting signatures as we speak. Well, the devil's in the detail, so I'm not going to comment on that one. Uh, but I can tell you that the one that just wants to say no, I don't support because we do have to have um, growth and building. And the county plan, you know, to the extent um, that it's necessary, should be, you should look at that county plan and why you're doing an amendment. Uh, but, you know, things have changed from the time they began to now. Uh, and we, we have a crisis on our hands. And, you know, people want the homeless off the street, but they don't want them near them. But, yeah. you know. If, if you were to get 50% of the vote, or more in this race, in this primary, you would win the seat. There is another measure that's trying to get signatures to go to the ballot that would require all of these elections to go to a, a November runoff, regardless of how well somebody did in the primary. Would you support that? No. I think a better approach might be that you only have one election in November. That's what they, what people want. Because if people feel strongly about something, they should come out in June. But to have somebody, let's say somebody had 60%, and somebody had 40%. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense to make everybody spend more money to um, 
run another election in November because some of the people think that more people come out in November. So why do it that way? Uh, but, you know, to have people and the community have to pay the price because some folks think for them November is better than June. Um, I, don't, I don't agree with that. All right, we should probably let you go soon, but um, a couple last things. I did see a picture of you attending the Women's March in, in January. Um, this was set up on the anniversary of the inauguration of Donald Trump. I think it was explicitly an anti-Trump thing, but I know that it's got a much broader definition. Um, what are your feelings both on the march, on Trump, and, and why you went to that? Well, I've been fighting feminist issues for more years than I want to say. I was in uh, the March on Washington in 1978, mm -hmm. and I um, am a firm believer in— uh, Was that the Equal Rights Amendment? Yes, course? it was the Equal Rights Amendments, yes. So I marched in that parade because I wanted to uh, be there again. I haven't had much time, you know, in my previous job to do anything like marching and you know, yeah. get, get involved. And so I was there to support women, and um, I didn't see it as an anti-Trump thing, but uh, I can tell you I don't support— um, the uh, Trump. <laughs> you don't. You don't support him. No. Okay. Um. Well, I, I appreciate all the time. Is there anything else you want? You think I'll get a tweet from Mr. Trump? But <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it would probably we'll, be the best thing you could hope. We'll for. have to him. tag him in in our tweet yeah, we'll <laughs> announcing <laughs> this, and then maybe. Uh, um. Well, we really appreciate your time. My uh, uh, website is Bonnie Do Bonnie for Supervisor dot com. Okay. And uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity. It means a lot. Thank you very much.